Welcome back everyone to our lecture series on linear algebra based upon the textbook linear algebra done openly. As usual, I'm your professor, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. It's great to have you here today. Uh, today we're going to talk about section 4.7, uh, which is entitled the Graham-Smith algorithm. Now the Graham-Smith algorithm, or sometimes called the, the Graham-Smith process, is a way of constructing an orthogonal basis. Uh, the orthogonal projections and the like that we've talked about previously in this section, like the Fourier coefficients and what have you, uh, typically depended upon having an orthogonal basis. It turns out that using the idea of orthogonal projections, we can actually construct an orthogonal basis given any basis of a subspace. In fact, it doesn't even have to be a basis. If we have a spanning set, we can construct an orthogonal basis using this Graham-Smith process. Then when we're done uh, with constructing an orthogonal basis, if we want an orthonormal basis, we can normalize each of the vectors uh, to make them univectors. Now, some people present the Graham-Smith algorithm as normalizing along the way. I don't really see a need of doing that initially. We can always normalize when we're done. And the Graham-Smith process, it actually constructs the ortho orthogonal basis in a recursive manner. And so let's explain what we mean by that. So suppose we have already in hand a basis for our vector space W that sits inside of Fn. And so what we're going to do is recursively create a basis that's orthogonal in the following manner. Well, if that basis is empty, then, well, we're already done. We don't need to do anything about that because the empty basis is a orthogonal basis for the trivial subspace. Uh, but for a positive dimensional vector space, we're going to take, we already have the basis x1, x2 up to xp. And so we're not going to do anything to, to the first vector. v1, which would be the new basis that we're forming, we'll just take that to be x1, no change whatsoever. Uh, but for v2, what we're going to do is we're going to take the current x2 and we're going to subtract from it v1 dot x2 over v1 dot v1 times v1. That is, we take the orthogonal projection of x2 onto v1 and we subtract it from x2. And this is going to have the consequence that the new vector v1 will be orthogonal to the previous vector v1. Uh, so the current vector v2 will be orthogonal to the v1 using this orthogonal projection projectionality. And then for v3, we do the same thing. We're going to take the current x3. We're going to subtract from it the orthogonal projection of x3 onto v1 and the orthogonal projection of x3 into uh, onto v2. And when we do these together in tandem, this is the orthogonal projection into the subspace spanned by v1 and v2 of the vector x3. And so this new vector v3 will be orthogonal to the vectors x, uh, to the vectors v1 and v3, v2, excuse me. And so then we just replicate, we repeat this process over and over and over again recursively. v4 will be x4 subtract the orthogonal projection of x4 onto v1, v2, v3. x5 sorry, v5 will just be x5 subtract the orthogonal projection of x5 onto v1, v2, v3, v4. And we keep on repeating this over and over and over again until we get to the last vector, vp, for which we take xp, subtract from it, the orthogonal projection of xp onto v1, the orthogonal projection of xp onto v2, onto v3, onto v4, all the way down to vp minus 1. All right. And so uh, we do this step by step by step. And so each step along the way, we're, we're, at, we're replacing a, an x with a vector v, which will be orthogonal to all the previous v's. And we're going to have the property that every time we replace a vector v, sorry, we replace a vector x with a vector v, we don't change the span. So if we go from 1 up to k, 1 up to k, we don't change the span of the original set x1 up to xk, but we are replacing with orthogonal counterparts. And the basic idea is the following. x1 and v1 are the same vector, so interchanging them does nothing. Um, if you replace v2 
that that is if you replace x2 with v2, well, notice that v2 is just x2 minus some multiple of v1. Since we have a v1, you could replace that away and you get back the original x2. And so when we come to v3, uh, v3 is inside the span of x3, v1, and v2, which by mathematical induction, we know will have the same span as the previous ones. So v3 doesn't add anything new, but if we use v3 instead, we could reconstruct uh, we can reconstruct x3 using v3 and combinations of v1 and v2. So by induction, this doesn't change the spanning set whatsoever. So let's show you an example of how this process works in practice. So take the following three vectors, x1, which is 1, 1, 1, 1, x2, which is 0, 1, 1, 1, and x3, which is 0, 0, 1, 1. And this, is a, this will form a subspace of R4, that is, W is the span of x1, x2, x3. If we apply the Gram-Smith process to that, what do we get? Well, the Gram-Smith process will reproduce the exact same basis if these vectors are already orthogonal, but a quick check shows that they're not orthogonal. Um, if we take x1 and x2 together, the dot product is 3. x1 and x3 gives us a dot product of 2. And then x2 and x3 gives us a dot product of 2 again. So these things are not orthogonal. So step one of Gram-Smith is pretty easy. You just take V1 to equal X1. You don't change anything, so just get 1, 1, 1, 1 here. Make no changes whatsoever. Um, for V2, what we're going to do is we're going to take X2, and we subtract from it V1.X2 over V1.V1, and it times that by X1. V1, V1, excuse me. So let's see the details of that. So the original X2 is 0, 1, 1, 1. And so if we take the dot product of V1 and X2, X2 is the vector you see uh, just drawn right there, and then V1 is still just X1. If we take the dot product of those, we're going to get a 3. And if you take the dot product of V1 with itself, you get a 4. And we're going to times that by 1, 1, 1, 1, V1 there. And so when we combine those together, you're going to end up with 0 minus 3 fourths, so you get 3 fourths right there. Uh, you're going to get 1 minus 3 fourths, which is just a 1 fourth. And then that actually happens with all the other coefficients as well. So you get 3 fourths, 1 fourth, 1 fourth, and 1 fourth. And that should be a negative 3 fourths at the top there. Sorry about that. Uh, and so that gives us a vector which is going to be orthogonal to the original one. Notice now if you take v1 dot this v2, you'll get negative 3 fourths plus a fourth plus a fourth plus a fourth. That gives you zero. Now, if you are completely abhorrent to all fractions, uh, the ratio phobic amongst us might be panicked here. Be aware that you could notice there's a common factor of one fourth. If you were to scale that out, the one fourth, uh, you get negative 3, 1, 1, 1, like so. And this vector, negative 3, 1, 1, 1, is still orthogonal to V1. Um, we're going to get still negative 3 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 if we take the dot product. And as scalar multiples don't change, they don't change um, the span whatsoever, we actually could get rid of the 1 fourth and just take V2 to be this vector right here negative one, 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 one. We're gonna normalize all these vectors in the end. So it doesn't really matter what scalar multiple you do. If you prefer the integers, uh, that's perfectly fine. I do too. I'm not afraid of them, <laughs> but you know, I, I think integer arithmetic is a little bit easier than, than working with fractions. So we're gonna use, uh, we're gonna use negative three, one, one, one for our V2, all right? So how do we do V3 then? So we're gonna take X3, whoops. Uh, we're going to take x3, which remember that was the vector 0, 0, 1, 1. We're going to subtract from it v1 dot x3. Uh, so x3 is the vector I just wrote down there. v1 was all 1s. So you take the dot product, you get 2. This will sit over 4. And you times that by 1, 1, 1, 1. All right. And then we have to subtract from this also v2 which as we mentioned before, V2 is now going to be negative 3, 1, 1, 1. But we have to compute the Fourier coefficients. All right. Uh, if you take V2 dot X3, 
you end up with a two. Um, if you take v, if you take v two dot v two, you're gonna get a nine plus one plus one plus one. That's a twelve. Sits in the bottom. Now this, th these numbers will be a little bit different if you had uh, used the original v1 v2 we had this one right here but the thing is we can scale this because these Fourier coefficients will correct any scalar multiplication we have there that's why I'm, I'm perfectly happy using integers uh, let's simplify some of the fractions because uh, after all uh, one half uh, one one the, the two fourths is the same thing as one half and the two twelfths we can make that become a one sixth And so adding everything together for the first component, we are going to get zero minus one half. Uh, we're then going to get plus three sixth. And I'm going to help us out there. Uh, let's see. Three sixths, of course, is one half. Zero minus a half plus a half is zero. We like zeros. Uh, for the second component, we still get a zero. We're going to get a negative one half. And this time we're going to get a minus one sixth. And so I would need to write the this one half here. Like I said, we're afraid of fractions. This should be three sixth. So this will all add up together to be negative four sixth or negative two thirds. And then the, the third component is going to be 1 minus a half minus a sixth. So this is going to take the negative two-thirds we had before, but we're adding one to it. So we get a positive one-third. And then the last component is the exact same thing. So uh, we get another one-third as well. And so this is our vector v3. If you don't like the fractions, again, we could factor out the one-third. So we get 0, negative 2, 1, and 1. And so then we could just take v3 to be that scalar multiple, 0, negative 2, 1, and 1, like so. And if you check with the previous vectors, if you take... Uh, if you take v3 dot v1, remember v1 was the all ones vector, so you're going to get 0, negative 2, plus 1, plus 1, that's a 0. And if you take v3 dot v2, which is up here, negative 3, 1, 1, 1, uh, what you're going to see happening there is you're going to get negative 2, plus 1, plus 1. So that's also orthogonal. So these three vectors are now orthogonal, and so this is our new basis, C. We didn't change the first vector at all, the all ones vector. Uh, the second vector was then negative 3, 1, 1, 1. And then the last one we just got was 0, negative 2, 1, and 1. And so this provides now an orthogonal basis. An orthogonal basis for the original vector space w. We did not change the vector space, we just changed uh, that we now have an orthogonal basis, for which then we can do all the cool things with an orthogonal basis uh, for this vector space now. So we can always create an orthogonal basis if we need one. Now this is what if we want an orthogonal basis, and we also chose this so they're all integer numbers there. If we want, if we want an orthonormal basis, uh, then remember the idea is we need to uh, we need to normalize everything. So we could take u1 to be the normalization of v1. So 1, 1, 1, 1. The length of that vector is going to be the square root of 4. So we get the vector of all 1 halves. For the second one, we want to normalize that. So we take the vector, what did we have before? Uh, negative 3, 1, 1, 1. And we actually calculated the length of this thing earlier, remember? Because uh, when we were doing the Fourier coefficients, we had to do v2 dot v2, uh, which gave us the 12. Uh, well, now we just take the square root of that. 
which of course, if you want to, if you want, you can rewrite the the square root of twelve as just um, two root three. Uh, I don't know if that's necessarily simpler. I, I'm perfectly happy with the square root of twelve in the denominator there. So you two we're going to get negative three over the square root of twelve, one over the square root of twelve, one over the square root of twelve and one over the square root of 12. So that's our second vector there. And then for the third one, just normalizing this thing, u3, the vector we had was zero, negative two, one, one. And so if we calculate its norm, we're gonna get four plus one plus one, which is six, square root of six in the bottom. And again, just leave them. I, you don't need to rationalize the denominator. That's a silly thing that people tell us that never really gives a good reason Negative 2 over the square root of 6, 1 over the square root of 6, and 1 over the square root of 6. So with these vectors in mind, we now have an orthonormal basis. Um, if, we take, if we take the set u1, u2, and u3, this is now an orthonormal, an orthonormal basis. for w. So if we have a basis for any subspace, we can construct an orthogonal basis and then an orthonormal basis from that. And like I said, uh, if if you just have a spanning set, this process will automatically prune down that spanning set when you form the orthogonal basis. It'll Whenever you have a vector you didn't need, um, it'll actually produce a zero and just throw it out of the process. Now, I want to do an example with complex matrices here, or complex vectors here, because one has to be careful when you do your Fourier coefficients, you have like the vi dot xj over vi dot vi. When you're working with complex inner products, that is the Hermitian product, the order does matter. If you switch these two around on the top, you'll actually get the conjugate, and then you won't actually have an orthogonal basis that you need. Uh, so do make sure you get the order correct. As, and so let's go through the let's go through the details of that right here. So if we take our first vector uh, u, we're just going to leave it alone. We don't really need to modify whatsoever. So x1, the first vector we're going to construct right here, will just be u, 1, i, and 0. So to find the second one, we're going to call this one, or not y, we'll call it uh, x2. I guess that makes more sense. x2 is we're going to take the previous vector v, and we're going to subtract from it u dot v over u dot u right here. And remember, as we're taking the Hermitian product, we take the uh, conjugate of the first factor. So as we, I'm going to be a little bit more detailed in the inner product here. So if you take u dot v, you're going to get one bar times one plus i bar times zero plus zero bar times negative i. And this sits all above one bar times one plus i bar times i plus zero bar times zero. Of course, the bar is just the complex conjugate times this by the one i and zero, like so. Now, there's a lot of zeros here, so this does simplify simple enough. One, zero, negative i. And so the conjugate of a real number, of course, is just itself. So you can get one plus zero plus zero for the numerator. For the denominator, you get one plus one, i bar times i is just going to be negative i times i, which is one, and then zero there. One i and zero. And so that fraction, make sure that looks like an i. So the fraction, we get negative one half times the vector one i and zero. And so even though these are complex numbers, this will just be a linear combination like anything else we're gonna get one minus a half, which is a half. We get zero minus i halves, which would be minus i halves. And then we're gonna get negative i minus zero, so we get negative i right there. And so this should be orthogonal to the original vector. And again, if you don't like the fractions, take out the one half. Uh, that gives you one negative i and negative two i. Uh, 
uh, like so. And we can check, and we're going to take our x2, because we don't, we don't want the one-half scalar. We're, we're good without it. And so we're going to take x2 to be this vector 1, negative i, and negative 2i. And so let's check to see, in fact, if we got an orthogonal set or not. So as a reminder, the first vector, x1, which we didn't change, that was the vector 1i0. And x2 is what we just got a moment ago. 1, negative i, negative 2i. And so if we take the inner product of these things, remember we're taking the Hermitian product here, x1 dot x2. We're going to take 1 bar times 1. We're going to get i bar times negative i. And then we're going to get 0 bar times negative 2i. Uh, well, 0 times anything is easy enough. That's 0, even for complex numbers. You get 1 times 1, which is a 1. And then you're going to get a negative i times a negative i. That's a double negative, so you get 1 minus i squared. I'm sorry, i 1 plus i squared. Negative, or i squared itself is negative 1, so you get 1 minus 1, which is 0. So this, in fact, shows us that x1 is orthogonal to x2 like we wanted to. And this span didn't change. We still have the same spanning. We still have the same span that we did before. So if we take the subspace span by those two vectors, u and v, x1, x2 will span the exact same thing. So we have to be a little bit more careful with, with um, complex vectors. But other than that, um, it's, it works out pretty nicely. And so what I want to then talk about here is to... Uh, talk about the, the QR factorization of a matrix, which we've talked about various factorizations of matrices before, particularly in chapter three, we talked a lot about matrix factorizations like the LU factorization, factorization using elementary matrices and the like. Um, the QR factorization offers yet another important factorization that's closely related to this Graham-Smith process that we've been talking about right now. So imagine A is an M by N matrix with linearly independent columns. It doesn't have to be a square matrix, but we do, we do want them to have independent columns. Um, if there is a dependence relationship on the columns, this factorization isn't going to work. Um, then if we have independent columns, we can factor the matrix A um, as a product of two matrices, which we call Q and R, hence the QR factorization, where Q... Q is an M by N matrix, so it'll have the same dimensions as the original matrix A, but it'll, be ha it'll have orthonormal columns. Whoops. It'll have orthonormal columns to it, which I want to make a comment that uh, if, if this is an N by N matrix, this is what we would call uh, Q is an orthogonal matrix. Which we talked about orthogonal matrices in a previous lecture, 4.4, uh, I think. And orthogonal matrices have many ways of defining them. They're those matrices whose transpose is equal to its inverse, but that's equivalent to having orthonormal columns. Now, again, our matrix here does not necessarily have to have a square shape. It could be any rectangle. Um, and so this is sort of like the rectangular equivalent of an ortho orthogonal matrix. So Q will be an, or, uh, an orthogonal matrix, and the column space of A will be identical to the column space of Q. So we're not changing the span of the column vectors here. So that's Q. Uh, R, on the other hand, is going to be an N by N, so it will be square. It'll be upper triangular matrix, and all of the diagonal entries will be positive. And in particular, if you have a triangular matrix whose diagonals are non-zero, that means it'll be an invertible matrix. So R will have an inverse to it. And so I want to give you a quick explanation how one constructs this thing. So uh, the proof is essentially the algorithm for one finds the QR factorization. So you'll be given the matrix A. You start off with that. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to gram smith the columns of a okay and so then you're going to get this basis so the second step here is q is formed from 
this orthogonal basis, this, I should say, ortho orthonormal basis that you just constructed here. And maybe I should specify this in here in our description that we do want it to be orthonormal. The orthonormal basis. That is the columns, uh, the, the columns the columns of Q are going to come from this basis right here. And so once Q is in hand, it turns out R is pretty easy, easy to compute. Um, to compute R, all you have to do is you take R equal to Q transpose A. And that's it. Um, now, of course, if you have a complex matrix, instead of taking Q transpose, you should take Q star, because um, that's what's necessary to have the appropriate orthonormality of the columns right here. And the basic reason this works is if you look at Q transpose Q, uh, Q transpose A, what you're gonna do is you're gonna get a matrix, all of which you have these inner products, uh, QI dot AI, where AI, um, where, where QI is the columns of Q and AI are the columns of A. And so when you take the transpose, and work through multiplication, the matrix multiplication, you get a bunch of these dot products right here. You get these, all of these QIs times the AIs, like so. And I should mention that um, the order the order in which you place the original basis will kind of will affect the Gram-Smith process because the process is recursive. If you change the order of the original basis, that does change things a little bit. And so in order to get uh, the matrix R to have all positive entries, you might have to change the order of columns. Uh, that It's not such a big deal. Uh, one can do it and make sure you get positive columns. It, it, this will become actually more, more obvious when we talk about the determinant in the next chapter because we do similar things when we change the order, you change the sign of some things. And so let's see an example of this. So I wanted to just use the same, the same, um, matrix we've been doing this whole time. So take the matrix you see right here. Uh, it's a four by three matrix whose first column is one, 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 one. Second column is zero, one, one, one. And third column is zero, zero, one, one. The columns will probably look familiar. These were the X, uh, the X one, two, and three that we had earlier. Um, if we apply the Graham Smith process to this, you'll remember that column one became the all one half vector. 0, 1, 1, 1 became negative 3 over root 12, 1 over root 12, 1 over root 12, 1 over root 12. And then 0, 0, 1, 1 became 0, negative 2 over root 6, 1 root 6, 1 root 6. So if you apply the Gram-Smith process to these three column vectors, you get these three columns right here. And as we saw before, this is an orthonormal um, set of vectors. So that's the hard part of the QR factorization. You apply the Gram-Smith process. And so that's the little summary we'll have right here. You take this, uh, this matrix, and you apply, you apply the Gram-Smith process. That's how you get this matrix Q. And then how do you get R? If you take the formula we had before, take Q transpose A. Now, if Q is an invertible, if, 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 this, if A is a square matrix, Q will be a, will be a square matrix as well. And you're going to get Q transpose is just the same thing as Q inverse. And so that's basically what we're doing here. Once you have Q and A, you can solve for R by taking the by the inverse. But as this is not necessarily a square matrix, we can use transpose and get something that kind of mimics the inverse in general. And so if you take Q transpose, which you see right here, Q transpose, and this is the original matrix A. If you go through all the possible products like one half, one half, one half, one half times one, 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 that'll give you four one halves, which add up to be four halves, which is two, the first bit. Uh, then the second one, you're gonna take one half, one half, one half, one half times zero, one, 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 right? You should get three halves in that situation. And then the last one, you'll get uh, two halves, which is that. And you know, go through all the details. This will give you your matrix R. And we did position the vectors in such a way that we get all positive entries. If this didn't work, you might have to permute the order of these columns and then permute the order of these rows accordingly. And that'll actually give you, that'll switch up the coefficients so that they're positive. And this gives us our QR factorization. Um, in the next lecture, we'll talk about an application of the QR factorization relevant to the least squares problem, amongst other things. Uh, but yeah, to get the QR factorization, really just apply the Graham-Smith process 
and do a quick matrix multiplication after that. I say quick, but I mean the the matrix Q is gonna probably have some uh, square roots floating around here. Since it's an orthonormal set of vectors, the columns are, it's not gonna be the prettiest vec uh, vectors you ever have, but there are some huge benefits of having that orthogonal set and this orthogonal factorization of the matrix A. And so that concludes section 4.7. Uh, thanks for watching today. If you like this video, then please subscribe uh, and to, just to help, you know, make some more videos in the future. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the comments below. If you like what you saw, please comment about those as well. And I will see you next time as we conclude chapter four. Uh, thanks for listening. Bye.